If your samples give you light back when you illuminate them, you might learn a lot from their structure and interactions by examining their lifetime. Luminescent materials are often discussed in terms of their quantum yield and their lifetime. While quantum yield refers to the percentage of light that's given back, the lifetime tells us how long the molecule is in that excited state before returning to the ground state. Photoluminescence is often discussed using a Jablonski diagram. Here we have the molecule in its ground state. The molecule can be excited with a specific wavelength of light to the first or even the second excited state. In this case, S represents a singlet state, where the pair of electrons will always have opposite spin states. The transition that occurs depends on the wavelength of light used. Within these excited states, there are distinct vibrational energy levels. Once a molecule has been excited, it will undergo vibrational relaxation to the lowest vibrational level of this electronic excited state. If any of these energy levels overlap with other energy levels from other states, other deactivation processes can occur. In internal conversion, we go from one singlet excited state to another singlet excited state. However, under intersystem crossing, we go from a singlet excited state to a triplet excited state. In triplet states, the electrons are unpaired and have the same spin orientation. From any of these ground vibrational energy levels, there are multiple processes that can take us back to the ground state. We can have a non-radiative process, like vibrational relaxation, or a radiative decay process, such as fluorescence or phosphorescence. For each of these radiative decay processes, we can define a lifetime. The lifetime is the average time a molecule will spend in this excited state before it returns to a ground electronic level. Our lifetime, or tau, will always be characteristic for that decay process. This means it's repeatable for this sample, in this solvent, or under these conditions. This means that changes in tau can tell us about changes in the conditions that our fluorescent or phosphorescent molecule is experiencing. If we can measure the time between our sample being excited and the time the sample emits a photon, we can learn the lifetime. But for this, we need to excite our sample with a short excitation pulse and collect the emitted photons until we reach a background level. The lifetime will have a distribution associated with it. So, if we record very many of these excitation events, we can plot it on a graph of intensity against time. On a linear scale, this will form a simple exponential decay if we have one component being excited and decaying with a constant lifetime. Here we can see our excitation pulse. On this plot, we can easily find tau as the time taken for the emission intensity to drop to 1 over e of its initial value. In practice, mathematical fitting of the decay is used for more accurate and more complex results. Because this is an exponential decay for a single emitting species, if we put this on a log scale, we will see a straight line. Here at Edinburgh Instruments, we use a technique called Time Correlated Single Photon Counting, which is capable of recording many thousands of these excitation emission events to create decay curves like these examples we've seen. To find out more about how TCSPC works, keep watching for the next video in our series. Thank you.